One of the most difficult, yet at the same time most rewarding seasons for outdoor and landscape photography is during the winter months. I, for one, personally love the look of a freshly fallen blanket of snow. It has a, a way of really cleaning up a composition, creating a very simplistic or minimalistic scene, and it completely transforms a landscape composition. But it, it's definitely not all roses. Winter photography comes with a very unique set of challenges that you have to solve for, and that's the purpose of this week's video, is to discuss the issues with winter landscape photography. Now, to jump right into it, I broke this down into to four parts or four categories, and the first one has to do with personal comfort, and this is probably the most important of all four categories, is just ensuring that you are comfortable while you're on location. I remember the first few times that I went out for a, a winter shoot and I was grossly underprepared. I, I felt that I was warmer, you know, in my home while I was getting ready or while I was traveling to the location, I felt good. And as I was hiking to the location, I felt fine. I was plenty warm. But as you're moving around, you're, you, you know, obviously your heart rate is up and you're hiking to your location. You're probably even sweating a little bit. You feel much warmer. But what I did not prepare for is how cold I would get when I stopped moving. Once my composition is set and all my gear is out of my bag and I'm just waiting for, for the sun to rise or the sun to set or the good light to happen or, or whatever I'm waiting for, that downtime when you're just sitting there waiting, whether it's 15 minutes or 45 minutes or maybe it's an hour, you can get cold very, very quickly. And that's something that I uh, really underestimated in the, my first few attempts at uh, winter outdoor photography. And I focus on now that something called the uh, the warmth pyramid, which starts at your, your head, your face, it goes down to your hands, and then, of course, your feet. So the very first thing I find that's absolutely critical is just a, a good hat to cover your head and your ears. I actually got this one from, uh, from my kids for Christmas, which I haven't used yet, but it looks awfully warm. But definitely a good hat is critical. And then this is something that I got, I believe within the last couple of years, and I think it's called a neck gaiter. And you basically just, you pull it over your head and it covers right around here on your neck. And it's kind of like a scarf, but without uh, all the, the ends of a scarf flopping around. But this is great. Not only does it keep your neck warm, but you can also pull it up against the, uh, the lower half of your face, your mouth, your nose, if you get really cold. But this has been a, a great addition to my uh, cold weather photography gear that I've been using lately. And then perhaps the most important is your hands. Now, if you've ever been in a very cold situation where you did not have adequate gloves and your hands begin to get very cold, they start to move very slow, and you, you basically lose just general dexterity of your fingers and trying to manipulate the little dials on your camera and make camera setting adjustments becomes not only very frustrating because your hands, they just don't operate like you're used to them. It just, it's, it, it really takes a lot of the joy out of your outdoor photography shoot if your hands are frozen. So a good pair of gloves is critical. I have found that using a, a two layer approach works the best for me. I use these very thin gloves. They're from North Face. And these are the gloves that um, they're called E-Tip, which basically means that you can, um, they work for a touch screen. So whether it's your iPhone or, or any kind of phone that's got a touch screen and they're thin enough to operate the dials on your camera. And I use these as kind of like a base layer. And then I put these gloves on top of them. These are from Valorette, and I think Valorette probably makes the best uh, winter photography gloves in my opinion. And the best part about these gloves is that the thumb and the index finger come, or basically they peel back to expose. And they have these little magnets here, so it kind of holds it back. That way it's not flopping around right here. But that's a very nice touch. And then I have these gloves underneath. So it'll basically expose the base layer, but I can still manipulate the, uh, the dials on my camera or I can use uh, my phone for any kind of um, weather app or if I need to make a phone call or whatever it is. But that kind of two layer approach has definitely worked the best for me. And I only use both layers if it's extremely cold. If it's not super cold, I'll just use the Valorant gloves. But this system has definitely worked for me very well over the years. And then as far as your feet go, I find that these smart wool socks work great and I'll usually will double layer these up too. But really just any kind of warm, uh, warm socks will, will suffice. Just being aware that your feet will probably get very cold while you're out there is just a, a good thing to, to be cognizant of. And these are the boots that I've been using. These are from a brand A Solo. I've had these for about two years now. They're insulated and uh, they work pretty well. I haven't had any issues with them. They stay generally warm in conjunction with a good pair of socks. And then as far as just my overall body goes, I have found that 
these base layer from Under Armour works very well. They come in different degrees based off of how cold of weather you're gonna be in. These are the base 2.0s. I think they go all the way up to 5.0, which is basically just a thicker version. But these are absolutely amazing. This is the uh, the bottoms, these are the tops. They're a little bit pricey, but man, do they keep you warm. And it really helps me to not have to wear five, six, or seven layers because I don't really like doing that either. But now I just, I just wear this, maybe uh, two layers on top of that, and of course my jacket. And that's it. And these things keep me very, very warm. But that's kind of just the, the personal care setup that uh, I usually will um, encompass when I go on these trips. And these, these are kind of the secret weapon. These hand warmers, these are super cheap. I think you can get a pair of these for 50 cents or maybe a dollar. You, you can buy them in bulk. But these are great. And I slide these in everywhere. I put them in my socks. I put them inside of my gloves. I put them uh, all over the place. And it just really helps just kind of add a little bit of warmth while you're on location. So these are absolutely critical. Now, the next component to all this, so now that now that you're comfortable, you're warm while, on, while you're on location, you're safe while you're on location, which is the utmost importance, the next thing you wanna focus on is your gear and how you're gonna care, care for your gear. And perhaps the biggest issue with cold weather photography is cold weather battery drain. Now, a lot of the, the newer cameras today do a little bit better with this, but um, if you're using a mirrorless camera system or if you're using a, a, a mirrorless camera system that's a few years old like I am, you'll know that cold weather really sucks the power out of these batteries very, very quickly. And what I generally do is uh, take all of my batteries and I'll put them in an interior pocket of my jacket, just that way it's kind of close to my body, and use the warmth of my body while I'm hiking and traveling to my location. Because what happens a lot of times, is, especially if you leave a camera, or leave a camera, if you leave a battery inside of your camera while you're traveling to your location and you're hiking to your location, if that battery was 100% charged when you first put it in, the morning you left or the evening you left, more than likely when you go to turn on your camera that first time, that battery will have already drained down to say 60 or 70% because it's been sitting in the cold camera or your cold camera bag the entire time you've been traveling to your location. So I never put a battery in my camera until I get to my location, tripod is set up, my camera's on my tripod, I have the idea of the composition ready to go, and until I have to absolutely turn on my camera to refine my composition, that's when I'll put in the very first battery. But keeping them stored close to your body in an interior pocket, and of course traveling with um, more than a few, more than one is definitely a good practice to get into. But it's not all just about the batteries. One of the biggest issues has to do with after your shoot and what you do with your camera and lens at the end of your shoot. Because what happens a lot of times is, you know, you've been out in the cold for an hour, two hours, you're very cold. You're packing up, you put your camera gear away, zip it up in your bag, you get to your car, you turn your car on full heat because you're freezing, of course. But what's happening is you're heating up your camera too quickly. Your camera was very, very cold. And then you're in in introducing a ton of warm air and that's ultimately gonna create a lot of condensation and moisture buildup on your lens, inside your lens, on your camera sensor, or across all the kind of delicate components of your camera. And that's an absolutely bad situation. You do not wanna do that. And what I have found works the best for me is while I'm still on location, before I even put my camera away, I'll take out a big Ziploc bag. Now this might not be able to fit your camera and lens that you've been shooting with, but if you have to, you could just put one lens in one bag or your camera body in another. But I'm able to put my Sony a7R 2 and my 16 to 35, if that's what I'm using, in this one bag. And then before you get in your car, before you put the bag, your camera in your bag, put the, the camera in here and seal it up. And you wanna lock in a lot of that outdoor air that your camera's been exposed to. And once it's sealed up, then you put this inside of your camera bag and leave it there. Leave it like that for a while. You know, while you're in, while you're in your car, don't take it out. If you get to your hotel room or back to your house, just leave that set up in your bag for an hour or, so, hour or two because you ultimately wanna bring the temperature of your camera up very slowly because that's gonna avoid that condensation buildup. And these things are great too. These kind of uh, silica gel packs. These things, you can find these in anything. Almost everything that I unbox has at least one or two of these and I save them all. And they're great to just throw inside your camera bag or to throw where, or to put wherever you're storing your camera gear after a shoot if it's been, if you're shooting in the winter months, because these things will absolutely absorb any kind of moisture that's in the environment that's around you. And these are great, This, these ones right here. 
What's cool about it is they have this little dot. If it's blue, that means this packet is fully charged. If it turns pink, that means you need to recharge them. And these are reusable. So you can just, I think you put them in the oven for a couple hours at like 400 degrees and it recharges these silica, silica gel packs. And I've had these for a couple years now. So these work really well. And I'll put links to all this in the description below if I can actually find a link to these. Just that way you can take a closer look. But now that your, your body's comfortable, you're comfortable, your gear's comfortable, your gear is, is cared for, the next issue that you're going to run into is your camera settings. Now, one of the biggest struggles that uh, cameras have today has to do with the metering system related to snow or winter scenes. A camera's metering system really struggles in this type of a situation where it always wants to underexpose snow. Cameras always think that snow is brighter than it actually is. So a good best practice to get into is whenever you get on location and you have your composition set, you go ahead and you know adjust all your settings. And if you're if you set your exposure level to a point to where your camera is saying, yes, this is the proper exposure, just go ahead and increase that by a half a stop or a full stop or maybe even one and a half stops above that. Ultimately, just overexposing what your camera is saying is already a perfect exposure because it will always underexpose a scene. Here's a perfect example right here. This is a, a fully edited version and this is the image straight out of camera. So you can see the difference here. And in this situation, my camera was indicating that this was the proper exposure. And you can see here, even if we hold down the shift key and if we double click exposure to basically get the automatic setting from Lightroom, Lightroom is still only indicating just a slight bump in exposure. So not only, not only do cameras struggle with properly exposing snow, even post-processing systems do as well. So for this situation, I think I ended up increasing the exposure almost a full stop. But if you just get used to overexposing while you're on location, while you're actually taking the photograph, that'll ultimately enable you to not have to overexpose or to increase the exposure so dramatically in your post-processing, which will ultimately result in a little bit cleaner of a photograph. So always overexposing by anywhere from half a stop to maybe one and a half stops while you're on location is a good best practice to get into. But in this situation right here, I think it was right around there that I overexposed it. And uh, let me kind of go back to the original, somewhere close to that, but it was a, a far cry difference from uh, where it was straight out of camera. Now, the fourth and final component to all of this, now that you're, you're comfortable and your gear's cared for and you have your camera settings dialed in and you captured your camera and you traveled back home, the next issue you're going to run into has to do with post-processing. And specifically with exposure and, and white balance and your white points and your black points, those seem to be the things that, that cause the most issue when you post-process a, a, a winter landscape image. Mainly because white balance is kind of tricky when it comes to uh, winter scenes because it's really dependent on whatever is in the sky. So for instance, if you are photographing a winter scene and it's an overcast day, a lot of times your snow is going to look kind of yellowish or grayish. Or if you're photographing your winter scene and it's a crystal blue sky, there's not a cloud in the sky, your, the snow is also going to take on that same blue tint from the sky. So you're going to end up with kind of blue snow. And, and I got a couple good examples of that right here. So this is the raw image here and you can see how blue all the image or all the, uh, the snow is here. This was a, uh, there wasn't a cloud in the sky. I know it's kind of hard to tell here, but this was a very blue sky. And you can see that the snow is also very blue as well. And here is the final image when I corrected for it. So this is this raw straight out of camera. And then here is the edited version. So a, a big difference there. And here's another example. This is kind of a, a, a cooler white balance. Here's a warmer white balance of the same scene. And then here it is straight out of camera. So once again, here's a, a cooler white balance, warmer white balance, and straight out of camera. So there's a lot of uh, differences. And, and for me personally, I think white balance in a winter scene really has to do with kind of whatever you're looking for from that scene. A lot of people will try and, and make it look or make it make the image resemble more of what they saw while they're on location with their naked eye. Some people might want to might think that just a, a cooler look looks a little bit better, maybe a warmer look. So you, you definitely want to play around with it a little bit. But a quick tip for enter or for um, editing winter photos, I find is to always change the background of Lightroom to white because that's going to give you a good starting off point of what true white actually is. And then for this one right here, it was definitely underexposed. So I'm going to increase the exposure quite a bit on this one. And you can see how far to the right the uh, the histogram is going. 
So I think somewhere right about there looks good. Yeah, that looks good. And then I'm gonna hold down the Option key and I'm gonna slide the white point over just a little bit. I want those whites to kind of come through to about right there looks good. Maybe even bump it up just a touch more. I believe that looks good right about there. And then as far as the white balance goes, there's a couple different ways you can do it. Of course, you can take the, uh, the eyedropper and just drop it on a, uh, a neutral area of your scene or a white area. That sometimes will do a good job. I found find that Lightroom will generally overwarm a winter scene, whether using Lightroom's auto feature or the eyedropper. But um, let's uh, undo that. I'm gonna come back up here and hit this to auto. And I think auto actually did a better job in this scenario, but I think just kind of testing both of them out just to kind of get um, directional information and then you can kind of just tweak it from there. And I think for this one, I might reduce it just a touch. I think that looks good right about there. And then this is where we started. And then this is where we we're at just by updating the exposure, the white balance and the white point. So it's a big difference that this right here is a very underexposed, very co cool blue looking scene. And this looks a little bit more natural, more what I saw with uh, with my naked eye while I was on location. So those are really the, the four main issues that I have encountered with uh, any kind of winter landscape photography. And I hope that next time you go out on your winter uh, winter photo expeditions coming up here in the next couple months, that some of this information you can apply to your landscape photography workflow moving forward. If you have any questions, definitely leave those in the, que in the comment section below. And I guarantee I will get back in touch with you. And as always, I really do appreciate you watching this week's video. And I'll see you next week. Bye.